Olá, esse é mais um Arqueologia em Ação e hoje nós estamos aqui com o professor Dr. Bruce Bradley da Universidade de Exeter que vai falar pra gente um pouco sobre o povoamento das Américas. A entrevista será em inglês, mas você pode acompanhar na legenda que a gente vai colocar aqui no, embaixo do vídeo. Uh, Bruce, professor Bruce Bradley, thank you to, to the interview, for the interview. Uh, so we're gonna talk a little bit now of peopling of the Americas. Right. Uh, When people start to, to arrive in America? Well, this is a very good question. In fact, the whole, the whole issue of how people came to the Americas is kind of a wide open question right now. Um, for a long time, we had a story that we, we could tell about how we felt that people came to the Americas. Uh, but evidence that's been accumulated over the last 20 years or so has indicated that it's much more complex than that. So. My answer is, right now, the earliest that we know are fairly confident people were in the Americas was about 22,000 years ago. And this is in, the, in North America, uh, and specifically on the east coast of North America. Um, and then we see people arriving at different times in different places, and whether they're part of that first group or not, we're not exactly sure all the time. So. Um, It's really an exciting time to be involved in, in the study of when people came to the Americas because now it's become sort of an open book. It, it's, 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 we, we have a lot yet to do. And um, when I was at, at university, uh, the story was told. We knew what happened and we didn't have to do any more work, basically. People still did work, but it was kind of like just filling in the, the gaps. But now it's completely opened up in terms of ideas and theories and hypotheses to test and we need hundreds of archaeologists working on these particular issues from all different angles from geoarchaeology to anthropological archaeology to field work to analysis i mean it's really exciting right now and um, where are the most ancient sites archaeological sites of america and where are the most ancient accepted sites by scientific community? Okay, that's, that's, a, that's also a really good question because acceptance is one of those things that often takes a long time. Uh, right now I'd say that, that generally um, American archaeologists, North American archaeologists accept a number of sites that are on the eastern United States, uh, sort of on the east side, uh, that date back approximately 15 to 20,000 years ago. So those are the oldest ones that are There's kind of general acceptance. Ten years ago, no, people didn't accept them. But new work has indicated that they look really good. The oldest uh, sites in, in South America right now are uh, younger than that. Uh, and generally accepted ones are probably 12 and a half to 13,000 years ago, maybe 13 and a half thousand years ago. But there's some really interesting new data that's coming out that indicates people were here older than that. There's some controversial things in, in Brazil specifically. Pedra Ferrada is a site that uh, looks like there may be human activity maybe 35, 40,000 years ago, uh, which would really be pushing it back. That's quite controversial still, um, but it, it, it's very, it, it has a lot of potential. So, you know, everything changes almost every week or every month or every year. There's new things that come out, new ideas, and new data, so. Uh, that's basically it. Now we have evidence of people in the western side of North America at about 14 and a half thousand years ago as well. So it looks like maybe it's a little younger, not quite so old on the western side as on the eastern side. Okay. So in North America is where, until some years ago, believed to be the, the first people of America. And uh, these people, they call it them Clovis. What you could say about Clovis people? Okay, what we can say is Clovis is, is a very, very distinctive archaeological culture. Uh, it has very specific kinds of artifacts that are, everybody recognizes and agrees are related to something that we call Clovis. Um, it's not necessarily a people. That's a new theory that's, that's sort of people are working on, specifically I'm working on which may be an idea that produced the artifacts and then that idea was transmitted from group to group so it's different people that became what we call Clovis. 
uh, with that's a theory it's not proven okay um, but what we do know about Clovis is in, in North America specifically is that when we first recognized it about 13,500 years ago uh, it, it seems to have spread across the entire continent within a very very short time I don't mean a life one person's lifetime but within a few hundred years okay so um, that's very, very unusual, especially if they were the first people. They, the, the, the Clovis sites, they have uh, just a little time they, they were find uh, North America, between 300, 700 years. Right. Uh, so that's very fast to, 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 to everybody learn how to, to make the that kind of tools that I call just are calling Clovis. Right. So, uh, what are the, what is the most ancient site of Clovis? And the earlier, how do you think that, that happened? Well, okay, Th these are really good questions. And th there's been this concept that up until fairly recently that Clovis was first. So they came to the, the hemisphere, North and South America, before anybody else had ever been here. So when they arrived, they arrived to a completely new continent, okay? Um, therefore, when you see this incredible fast spread uh, of an archaeological culture like we call Clovis, people everywhere in North America, even to the top of South America, uh, within such a short time, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't work in terms of anthropological theory or any other examples in the whole world of people migrating. So then the question becomes, could there have been people here before Clovis? And the answer is absolutely. That has been now demonstrated in North and South America. So there were, there were people here when this thing we call Clovis started. Now, the idea that it came from someplace else as a culture and came into the Americas seems to no longer be current. It looks like Clovis actually developed in the Americas from earlier cultures. And why it spread so quickly is a real, real question. So, uh, these most ancient sites of Clovis, the like Padifrada, like uh, these most most no. ancient sites, are still controversial, and people is yet and yet to know uh, from where they come from. But we maybe have some answers for these most acceptable ancient sites. Uh, Clovis or even South America uh -huh. between 13,000, 10,000 years ago. So, from where these people come from and where they, what's the, the way they followed? It's from Siberia, they came from Europe, they came from Polynesia. Right. Right now, uh, the two main hypotheses are that people came out of Northeast Asia, what's called across Beringia, where Alaska and uh, Russia used to be connected during the glacial maximum. So the glaciers used a lot of water and the sea levels dropped and so a lot of new land was exposed and it connected North America to Northeast Asia. Uh, we know archaeologically absolutely that people came that way and they came that way probably by about 14,000 years ago which is older than Clovis. Okay, it's a little bit older than Clovis. The, the other uh, hypothesis and well, in, in that case, there's two ways they could have come. Along the ocean margin, along the seashores, basically, following the seashores. Or they could have come on the interior through Alaska and then down through Canada between the glaciers. There's two huge glaciers at that time that covered almost all of Canada. Um, in fact, earlier than that, they did cover all of Canada. And then at a certain time, they started to melt and they started pulling apart and left a corridor of, of open, non-glaciated, Non ice land. Um, and the theory has been for a long time that people came through Alaska and down this corridor where there wasn't any ice into North America and eventually through and down to South America. At that early date, at 14,500 years ago, we now know there was no corridor. It was not possible for people to come that way. So the alternative is that they would come along the ocean margin. Okay? Uh, so out of East Asia, Far East Russia, maybe even Hokkaido and Sakhalin Islands in, in, in Japan and Eastern Russia and Kamchatka and up along the edge of the ocean and come across that way to the western side of North America. The other really 
current hypothesis that's still quite controversial is that people were able to cross from southwestern Europe during the glacial maximum, in other words, during the glacial period um, when the sea levels were down, and following the front of the ice, because every year the, the north would freeze, the North Atlantic would freeze, and then it would melt back, and then it would freeze every year. Um, and it could be a very, very rich environment with seals and, and uh, seabirds, etc. It would be quite attractive for people to follow. And so this theory uh, has people coming over about 20, 22,000 years ago, at least starting then, and probably coming back and forth and back and forth. So it wasn't a migration, it was expanding territory and ending up in North America. But then, as the Ice Age ended, the sea didn't freeze as much as, as it used to. The ocean started to rise, and that route would be cut off. They couldn't do it anymore. It wouldn't make sense to come from Europe and back and forth anymore. And it would isolate a population on the east side of North America. Right. So let's say 14,000 years ago, we've got people on the west coast and on the east coast of North America. But then we also have, at about 14,000 years ago, people in South America, and specifically as far south as the southern cone, Argentina. So the question is how they get there and are they related to the people in the north? And those are really big questions right now. Um, the, the, the idea is, well, people couldn't get there from anywhere else. They probably couldn't get from Africa. They probably couldn't get from Oceania, uh, Australia. So therefore, they must have come from the north. But that's just supposition at this point. We don't have evidence that they came from Africa or the Southern Pacific yet. <laughs> so. Um, and this is what's so exciting about this. There's so many unknowns and so many possibilities now that 20 years ago, nobody thought of anything other than just the one idea. One last question. Uh, it's a, a question about the lithic industries. Okay. When we talk about people in America, uh, the most of the research are about the lithic industries. Right. Why? Right. We study stone artifacts primarily, first of all, because that's what's preserved from that ancient time. Very few organic things survive. There's occasionally bone artifacts, things made out of bone, ivory, antler, sometimes. Uh, but we, we, we've lost everything made out of wood, made out of fiber, made out of plant materials, basically, with very few exceptions. So that leaves us with just stone. Now, the nice thing about stone, besides it's being preserved, is there's many, many different ways to shape stone that are behavioral. Um, so to make a, a spear point, for instance, something that you could kill a mammoth with or a large animal or make a knife to cut something with, what you basically need is some, for, for a spear point is something sharp at the tip that's sharp on the edges and you can tie it onto a spear. And that's all you need. And so with stone, you can make many, many, many different ways of making the same thing that works the same way. And those different choices are based on what we think is culture. So they're cultural choices, not just functional choices. Okay, so those cultural choices then reflect the, the, the thinking and the, and the being and the way people perceive the world and they're different from place to place and time to time. And that's what stone can show you. And, and learning how to understand the stone that we find, the stone artifacts, gets us a window into that past of those cultures. That's why we call them archeological culture, because they're ones that we make up based on these differences and similarities between things that we find. Um, and that happens to be one of my areas of, of real research is, is looking at the way stone was broken to make these different things. Um, and Although some people, if you don't understand it, you can say, oh, there's, there's only so many ways you can make something. But if you stop and think about stone is, at, basically, when we find stone tools, they were made with a, a grammar, almost like a language. And that grammar is, is there in the archeological record. We, we can see it, we can read it. It's like that's a, that's a word that's telling us how something was done. So. When we can build these grammars, we realize there's many, many different languages. And I don't mean spoken languages, I mean languages expressed in the way they made their tools. Um, and there's very fundamental differences in, in somehow the way they made their languages. For instance, 
the, the, the people that came from Siberia down the west side of the Americas had a very different approach to making their tools. They were doing the same thing as the people on the east, but they had a different way of doing it. So it's almost like if you, if you turn that into language, and I'm not suggesting that they have these same languages, but it'd be like the difference between Chinese and German, okay? So these are, the, these are the stones that were made by the people, or the stone tools that were made by the people that had this way of thinking and doing, which is Asian, and this is the way that the people that came from what's now Europe thought and did things, which are European, not, not European in the modern sense, but from that area. And of course, everybody ultimately gets traced back to Africa where they did one thing, and after they split, they split genetically, they split linguistically, and they split technologically. And that's what archaeologists study, is the technology of stones. Professor Bruce, thank you very much for the interview. That was very interesting, and it could showed us uh, how much we can still do for, for answer the, the important questions. So, well, well, you're more than welcome, and I really appreciate having the opportunity to come to Brazil. Thank you very much. Here we have uh, a replica of a pre Clovis style point that would be the kind that's found on the east coast of North America. Uh, kind of Cactus Hill, um, Meadowcroft, and down, down the east coast. And then this is a, this is a classic full, uh, Clovis stone. This is a classic Clovis point that shows the fluting at the base, and it's very thin and very flat. You see, and it's got some fluting on this side as well. So this is a classic Clovis point. And then this one is a point that we find in the western United States. It's probably made by people of Asian origin. It's relatively thick um, and, and made with a different kind of technology. So this is, this is the western style probably of European or original European origin, these two. And then this one is from Asian. Um, the, the major difference between these technologies is this is a technology where the width to the thickness is quite wide. So it's very thin, relatively thin. So this measurement divided by this measurement will give you about uh, a ratio of six to one maybe seven to one. Okay. This, on the other hand, is thicker in relation to its width, and you'll probably have a, a width to thickness ratio of two and a half or three to one. And that's not the only thing that's different. The way it's flaked is different as well. This, you can see the flakes here go across the middle, and that's what makes it flat and thin, whereas these flakes came off and stopped at the middle. So it didn't take much off the middle. And that's what makes them relatively thick here. And the, the pre-Clovis that we have on the East Coast is more like the Clovis than it is like this in terms of technology and shape. <laughs>